and I'm artistic director of Rhizome, a digital art organization um, based in New York City and affiliated with New Museum since 2003. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the first conversation in World on Wire Dialogues, a special partnership between Rhizome of the New Museum and Garage Digital of the platform of Garage Museum of Contemporary Art. Um, this series will pair up artists from the exhibition World on a Wire, which was organized by Rhizome of the New Museum in partnership with Hyundai Motor, um, is currently on view in Seoul and will be coming to Hyundai Motor Studio Moscow later this year, um, along with artists from Assuming Distance, an exhibition at Garage Museum, which we'll be hearing about in just a moment. Um, we have two fantastic artists here today for our screening and conversation, Theo Triantafilidis um, from World on a Wire and Sarah Kuhlman from Assuming Distance. Um, and uh, we'll be seeing some of their work and having an opportunity to talk about it. Um, both of their works um, involve practices of simulation and, um, and use kind of technological modes of storytelling to um, reflect on broader themes in kind of uh, our technological society. Um, I'm joined today also by Nikita Necheyev of Garage Digital, and uh, uh, I'm going to welcome Nikita to come in now to uh, share a little bit more about today's event. Nikita? Yeah, спасибо, спасибо, Michael. Uh, yeah, Thank you, Michael. Uh, I'm really happy to welcome everyone to our event tonight. Uh, this is the first uh, in a small series of discussions uh, which we are organizing together. My name is Nikita Nichayev. Um, I am uh, the curator of the Garage Digital Research Program. This is a program as part of the Garage uh, Museum of Contemporary Art uh, that supports art uh, and research uh, in innovative uh, technologies. Um, based on our shared interests uh, towards uh, art, uh, that as a medium or as a theme uses uh, simulation practices uh, reflecting on how we can find ourselves, uh, how we can interact with algorithmically created uh, generated worlds. Uh, we wanted to present uh, two artists uh, that have made it the basis of uh, their practice. Uh, We wanted to start uh, with uh, some brief uh, screenings and intros from the artists themselves. I think this is very important. Uh, it's really great. Uh, and to begin with, I will be passing the floor and the screen to Sarah Kuhlman, uh, who is a participant to the Garage Digital Program. In its most recent iteration, working with the Never Agency, so it's my pleasure to pass the floor to you, Sarah. Sorry. Hi, everybody. My name is Sarah Kuhlman. Um, I am an artist that uh, mostly works uh, with digital means uh, of production. Uh, this only describes uh, the technical and the conceptual form if you will, because um, we use uh, the so-called digital means uh, in order to bring uh, our internal narratives to the surface uh, in a new format uh, and to transform the use of technology in order to develop uh, other ideas. Uh, in a nutshell, the key part of my focus uh, is research uh, that I convey into the digital format. Uh, and the digital format itself enables me to identify various issues. Uh, as Nikita has mentioned, uh, there was a garage digital program that we participated in. And for this program, and this is my current project as well, I created and I continue to work on a project which is called uh, the agency of never it's a series uh, made up of uh, a number of stories uh, which uh, are published on the website uh, and they will then disappear down the line 
The whole project is dedicated to the subject that can be described as a problem of imbalance, problem of dimensions, problem of the inequality between the measurement systems, a problem of superstitions. And what we use to describe those problems, we often use the English word bias that in Russian can be translated by a dozen of words. And we can consider this term as an umbrella term. That is to say, there is a problem of bias in cognitive psychology, in sociology, in information science, in statistics as well. So a bias is a certain irregularity in data, in notions, in points of view, and sometimes they manifest themselves in very different areas of human life and in various sciences. All the series that will be created for this project have two formats, a video essay and a text, and they are brought together by a common player using which you can either watch the video or read the text and every one of the episodes describes its own compact story that is based on a certain case that i found either in social sciences or social history or the information science or in some related transdisciplinary sciences that intersect between themselves and we thus can see common patterns for example in human history or in mathematics and i would like to show one piece from this cycle it is quite small and it was created using the customary 3D game engine that I'm using. And it describes one of the interesting cases that I later would like to explain in greater detail after I show it. Can I ask you to launch my screening, please? If Garage launches the website, please launch the third episode. Yes, there is an interface there. Can you just click on the list and there you will see a list of episodes. Choose the third one and perhaps we will have to enable the subtitles or perhaps they're also already enabled. The sense of satisfied curiosity I felt before the end of the journey was akin to a simple revelation, the nature of which is similar to knowledge presented in its entirety. Approaching the planet, I knew the detail, a meek provincial sun with soft prominences and celestial milk different to each other's fate. How terribly mistaken for those who dare see one rocks pull towards another one as nothing but predetermined, a sign of their own hopes. Time and gravity was all I had, 
all that I had multiplied, bidding farewell to the bliss of a carefree life. Can my past be an expression of my will? Can my choice be considered my salvation? How few rocks will see nothing but eternity and ice growing bountifully upon their surface. How few rocks will fall from the sky that they have nowhere to fall on. You can keep their cool when heat melts the body and gas turns from an invisible veil into a shackle. One who can witness an give way to farming, eternity give way to routine. What do they see? They say people have risen from their clouds to make their way to the sky, and I was the first exception, reaching backward. Was I the lucky exception, or instead one punished for betraying the multitude? A heavenly stone does not belong in a furrow. There's no place for celestial glory among the rabble, they said, putting me in chains, hoisting me up, cutting me apart. Rock and flesh, there's not much of a difference. The same interstellar dust, compressed by eons. Now what? Am I a witness? A curiosity among silent remains? Did I measure my path with a fiery arc that consumes air? Or is eternity my punishment? Oblivion and ringing silence is my alcove. Inertia is my shroud. Vacuum is my home. I would like to say a couple of words about that piece. Perhaps the other parts, you will be able to watch them online and uh, you can find uh, them online if the broadcast was not perfect. I would like to give some background regarding this piece. Because some of the parts will perhaps be related to our further dialogue. So the background is as follows. Here we can see a monologue of a stone that is the first meteorite dated on Earth. It fell on the 15th century on the territory that was contested between France and Germany. That was the Holy Roman Empire and Prussia. And this territory historically passed uh, between France and Germany. I found parts of this meteorite in one of the Russian museums that is called the Museum of Extraterrestrial Substance. And indeed, part of this meteorite is now, uh, parts of those meteorites are now in various museums and laboratories all over the world. And when I started reading about the story of the stone, I found uh, an article in French and I tried to machine translate it and the translator translated stone as she because in Roman languages including French uh, a stone and a meteorite is uh, of feminine grammatical gender and in Russian it's a masculine gender so for us it's a bit neutral and uh, it's clear what you feel when you 
see this change of linguistic gender. The story transforms into a story of uh, a victim or a hostage. And here we can see exactly that cognitive bias when the story transforms and the relation appears. There is no neutrality. There is no zero position anymore. I created that 3D stage and uh, filled it with some downloaded objects from Sketchfab website. Various world institutions, museums and collections upload their objects there. They digitalize them and create their virtual collections there for free use. And if we look at the list of those museums and those collections, we can see that these are mostly countries that had some colonial power resources to create those collections. That is to say, it's the British Museum, American Museums, German Museums, several Russian museums. So when I started putting those items and those assets within the stage together with that digitalized meteorite with its strange story, it turned out that this is kind of a repository of curiosity, a kind of a repository of objects that came from various backgrounds, some cultural artifacts, scientific items, archaeological items, and uh, not dividing them into categories was very important. That is to say that muse that museum that represents a compilation reminds very much of colonial museums or some cabinets with curiosities that we can see in European history when collectors collected, how to put it, artifacts of human culture and human being and uh, natural objects together. So that was uh, an assembly of forms and objects. I decided to show that video because there you can see exactly how I used those assets that are freely uploaded online, how I used those libraries. It seems to me that for a contemporary culture and contemporary digital production, those objects are like elementary bricks or elementary units. And at the same time, they create a form. And at the same time, they are semantic. That is to say that bear some sense. And we will, I think, later talk about that because that's a very important part of a conveyor. It's a certain new factory and it's new tools. So I would like now to give the floor further to colleagues. Yes, Sara, thank you very much indeed. Thank you for this intro on your behalf. And I will be very glad to also invite Theo to share your practice, to share your work. Sure, thanks. Thanks, Sarah. That was uh, super nice to see um, um, your unpacking of the work. Uh, there's quite a lot in there. Um, my name is Theo Trentafilidis. Um, I have a background in architecture and um, have been based, uh, I'm from Greece and I've been based in Los Angeles for a while. Um, and I've also been working uh, for quite some time now with these sort of tools, um, the game engine, these ideas of simulation and um, um, and also like asset libraries and sourcing these um, like primary blocks for uh, building 3D worlds has also been a lot in my mind. Um, and uh, I also, connect a lot to uh, what Sarah was saying about sort of um, creating a stage with this 
sort of found objects of um, the digital um, sort of commons. Um, and uh, and usually I, I like to work with these in a um, uh, sort of performative way. So the couple of projects I will be showing is uh, are um, working with these tools in a performative context. Um, so let me share my screen. Um, sorry, give me a second. Um, okay. Yes. Good, now I need just this donut connector right here. Yes, this is, this is good. about this what is this piece oh it's like a dinosaur head <laughs> ah! Ah! why am i doing this what is my art about more weapons. <clears throat> weapons are good. Maybe. <clears throat> this one. Right here. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> uh, what about what do I do with this piece? Maybe I will talk over this a little bit. <laughs> um so in in this uh, in this series, uh, this particular work is called Studio Visit. Uh, it's currently on display in the exhibition uh, at Hyundai Motors Motor Studio in Seoul. Uh, and um, this is uh, my avatar. Uh, this is a uh, an avatar I've been working with for a while, um, and this was a gallery I'm working with in New York. So I recreated this space, uh, started working with this avatar uh, in virtual reality uh, for about six months, uh, being in, immersed in VR and looking at myself as this avatar in a virtual mirror, like looking, uh, like really trying to find the voice and the movement uh, I started adding weights to my body um, and trying to uh, really bring this character to life, basically. Uh, and through through this series, I was looking a lot at um, this uh, sort of bad boy artist stereotypes and the way that uh, like some a particular generation of sculptors have this very like macho approach to uh, building large sculptures uh, and myself being um, an artist who usually works in a small laptop in a small studio I was trying to like play with this um, the the problems of this fantasy of um, <clears throat> being this heroic sculptor uh, and at the same time uh, working with a few uh, stereotypes of characters in video games um, and then there was also this aspect of 
um, virtual space and uh, the representation of this. Maybe uh, I'm not going to show it now, but uh, these sculptures that I created inside virtual reality were then translated into physical objects as these two two dimensional cutout shapes, basically. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, and then there is this element of performativity and uh, this motion capture recording uh, that goes on top of them. Um, and then uh, another work that came after this that was shown, what's premiered in 2020 in Sundance, uh, I'm going to show you this. Yo, Linksa. Yo, how do you stay so um, styled and composed all the fucking time? Why? Always looking so good, that's all I'm saying, man. You have me out here looking like a slob. A spider slob. <laughs> Yo, let's play a game. Where could Spider be? Yo, you're too good at this game. So what do you want to do now? Yeah, so here we have um, a more theatrical live performance or a theatrical version of a similar system like in the previous work. Uh, I wanted to see what happens when um, the game engine is utilized in a live performance context and seeing how uh, these two actors or protagonists would um, be performing as players within a video game world. This is, by the way, is based on a comic book by Connor Williamson. Uh, and the game engine side is an entire uh, open world map, kind of like a small GTA map, um, a Grand Theft Auto map, where uh, the two performers can uh, freely navigate and interact with different things. Uh, the male performer is constantly immersed in virtual reality and can only see this world but cannot see the physical audience, uh, whereas the female protagonist is wearing a motion capture suit that uh, gives her a much greater control over her avatar, uh, but then she's more grounded in the physical stage and is directly uh, inter interfacing with the audience. Um, and behind the scenes, there is a game engine performer and live music and, um, and another performer. So the whole world is being like animated and performed in real time as well. Um, yeah, I think I'm gonna stop here and we can like unpack these as we go. Fantastic. Thank you both so much for sharing that work. Um, uh, yeah, it's it's so interesting to see um, all the different kind of points of connection that come up between your respective practices. I mean, um, I think in a way the scene of the first work from Agency of No One that we saw by Sarah was the museum. And then sort of the scene of the second um, work by Theo uh, was the artist studio. Um, so there's already kind of there's kind of a relationship there and there's also a way in which both of you i think are are thinking about um 
like longer histories of representation and then how they continue on and are reframed in relation to new technologies of simulation. Um, because we have the kind of museological display, the assembly of objects in, um, in Sarah's video. Um, and we have the process of creating the sculpture in the artist's studio, the kind of mythical location of artistic production in the second work. Um, the third work uh, sort of brings in the um, a kind of different scenario, I would say. And in a way, I would say that this is kind of a work that's that's set in a video game world, in a sense. And what's interesting about that is that it's set in a video game world, even though when you see the performance, what you're seeing is actually um, two physical actors on a stage wearing motion tracking devices of different kinds, as well as their on-screen characters. So it's a way of setting a narrative in a video game world while having it take place partly in the immediate physical reality of the audience. Um, I had the good fortune of seeing it at ONX Studio uh, last month, which was really interesting. But I think that for me, um, this kind of relationship makes the question of, of sort of format or, um, or, or media uh, that is being used for storytelling to become a really interesting point of comparison um, between the two of you. Um, and I wanted to ask, maybe this is kind of a concrete question, Theo, but I was interested if there are elements of um, Antigon that are unscripted and things that can change because of the computer's sort of um, generative um, open-endedness um, and whether for each of you, um, yeah, how kind of this, the specific affordances of telling a story through a video game engine or a generative system, um, I guess, change your relationship with the, with the kind of um, world or narrative that gets made. Um, yeah, if I may, um, for, for Antigon, we have been showing a few different iterations of the work and sometimes we try to keep it like more open and more improvisational and have the actors respond a lot more to the game world. And sometimes it becomes a little bit more scripted. I think the ONX version you saw is our furthest away from the script we've gone so far. <laughs> um, but there is elements of the world that are alive, like there is a, a traffic system where there is people walking around and boats and um, like things that are simulated. Uh, so the world is alive on its own, even if the performers don't do anything. And then there is decisions and choices that the performers can do. And then there is the game engine performer side that is constantly like manipulating the game engine and trying to bring like different obstacles and challenges to the performers. It's interesting, Sarah, because when I saw your work, I was thinking initially of your work more in a cinematic frame. But in a way, like when we look at just that one video, it doesn't feel so much like cinema as more like um, architectural or uh, installation space that has been created in some way. Um, how do you see it? Do you see what you're doing as cinema through the game engine or is it uh, another kind of, or, or does it have more in common with installation work or setting up a physical space in a way? Um, я бы хотела такой um, инженерный комментарий дать по поводу... Uh... I guess I would like to make an engineering comment uh, on the gaming engines uh, that uh, contemporary artists to work with because uh, the developments in the gaming engines uh, and renders uh, on video cards and not on the processors uh, this is an internal breakthrough, a revolution in art, uh, similar to the development of oil painting back in the day when artists transitioned to a more high-tech way of producing images. Uh, and it's interesting that in any event, uh, technologies, um, new technologies, uh, give us an impetus towards new means of using them and i would say that well as i observe what's happening in the art world uh, with my colleagues and in my own work i see that to a certain extent 
it's a trend working with gaming engines because in a way it's a very democratic a very accessible way of doing 3d which was never previously accessible due to the slowness of uh, the rendering process and uh, it's also a performative way of using 3d because you can you can't you don't have to stick to the standard methods uh, like uh, creating a setup or moving the camera through the stage working with a script uh, what you can do now is uh, you can focus on certain interactive elements uh, like they was talking about uh, or like artists do that don't want to strictly focus in just a video gaming or just in video art um, they don't want to purely focus on the on either and to me it's a way of um, getting to feel the material uh, and to be frank i wanted to explore in the video that i did show i was exploring these opportunities the specific opportunities of camera movements that would be impossible in the real life in the real world unless you use really super expensive equipment let me just explain that uh, uh, people that work with video you would know that um, you can zoom in physically and at the same time you have the optic zoom uh, and what that gives you is this shift in the perspective that we sometimes see in orthodox icons for instance uh, if you observe the way the space changes sometimes you see these you catch these distortions that are really hard to capture using a physical camera or with the eye the human eye and these are very sensitive triggers very sensitive points that uh, we can get from the material itself from the fabric of these gaming engines their essence uh, taken into account among other factors so the fact that we do use scripts so we do use some visual coding elements uh, in order to achieve certain effects uh, so it could come across just as a video clip and at the same time you're using programming nonetheless and so yeah so so it's interesting it sounds like there is a relationship between the camera as a scripted element of the larger architectural scene so in some ways separating out the spatial arrangement and the cinematic aspect is incorrect because the camera becomes a part of the space and moves through it in according to kind of programmatic decisions that are made um, which is an interesting extension i think of cinema but i i wanted to return to your comments about bias at the beginning in particular because We've, we spent some time now talking about the new possibility presented by simulation. And um, if I could just add one more question, which I, I'm, I'm curious about like how these possibilities introduce their own kind of bias or what kind of bias you're seeing in the game engine as a way of imaging certain narratives of the world, I suppose. So to what extent are you interested in the the politics or framing that these technologies introduce to your subject matter as a means of, um, I guess, ex exploring the themes of, of your work? Well, sorry, what I would say is, um, I guess I'm more interested in um, certain manifestations of these biases. What I mean is they can manifest themselves uh, both as political, social and information biases. And, but to me, I guess it's more of an anthologic, uh, anthological issue because uh, I, I see an issue with the categories, with the categorization, with the uh, disassembling, reassembling. What I would say is so uh, these um, issues exist in computer sciences and, and, and programming. Uh, 
ontological methods that use that and in humanities as well. And working with digital objects to me is not so much how to use a new technology or, well, that too, but it's rather how by that you can reassemble knowledge to identify these information leaks, to identify this imbalance, and how you would connect narrative technologies uh, and semantics that's a part of uh, the structure of everything. So it's more, it boils down to knowledge for me because all of the elements that we use, our graphical elements, etc., each of the elements represents a certain unit, a certain part of knowledge. It's an actor, quite literally. In computer engines, uh, the, the world, well, you've got the world and you've got the actors. So quite literally, it's like a scene, it's a stage and actors playing on stage and each of the elements, each bit of the code, each model, each texture, they represent a certain position. It's like a parliament or, or a community. And we understand that because it's a digital, object and digital digits also contain certain information so you can you can read it as a, a bit of knowledge representation i guess that's the way i would put it that's really beautiful <laughs> i'm not sure if i answered your question fully though I think you disagreed with the terms of my question, which is also a good answer to the question. I have a much more banal um, uh, <laughs> reply. Um, I feel like there is, to me, there is like a few, there is these biases in the game engine, which range from the very obvious ones, like the, um, sort of subliminal persistence of violence in this um, in the way that the whole system is built like and that's something that I like to play with a lot uh, there is always like whether you when you're starting to work with a game engine whether you like it or not there is all these tools for vi built for violence that are there and really easy to get uh, to have around and there is also in the audience the connotations like once you get into a first person view or a third person view and there's a certain type of camera movement that is common in shooter games you automatically uh, make these associations um, and then I think on on another side I'm also very interested in the sort of politics of uh, of the game engine companies themselves and how they are um, uh, constantly in this very weird cold war between uh, different engines and different um, <clears throat> sort of functionalities and tools that they are introducing uh, and also like looking at how they are trying to frame the engines as a product and what is the um, uh, sort of target audience for them. Like already there is in the Unity game engine website, uh, there's very specific categories like automotive industry and um, like architecture visualization and video games. And there's already like, um, a very rigid categorization of different use cases and different tools that are built for these use cases. 
Мне бы было интересно, наверное, продолжить э, таким вопросом в сторону э, одновременно. It would be interesting to go on with a question about media and the narratives that you are developing in your work. For example, Sarah, in your work, the work in itself is a digital platform, a streaming service that is trying to replicate the logic of a streaming service with uh, some perturbated logic, or perhaps in your video, Theo, there is a protocol of visiting the artist where there is a bias. So, and also the, this very meeting is a certain disruption of a theatrical protocol. So as a result, the spectator faces this kind of new art. And uh, it's interesting for me to learn how you are reprogramming or creating such problematic narratives and protocols of meeting with art. And is it also one of the subjects with which you are working using different media and uh, this may also impact the choice of tools and algorithms that you use in order to disrupt those algorithms yeah sarah would you like to go first Yes, I can say that I actually recall one example that is more related to some social platforms. It's not really related to art, it's rather related to popular culture. Recently, Balenciaga brand removed their Instagram account and uh, all of the Instagram content because they decided that the content that you see in Instagram is very homogeneous. And it seemed to me that this is a certain turn towards the objects that we used to call websites or web pages, and uh, we had the impression that they died for a certain period of time. I will try to get closer to your statement and to your question now. I mean, reviewing protocols is uh, something very alive, and it depends on so many factors. not just what's happening in the sphere of technology, but also how life in itself is transforming social reality where you exist. So I would like perhaps to highlight how to put it. When you predict some technologies and protocols, it turns out that it's actually impossible to do so because uh, the humanity and the human reaction is much more complex than a certain exponential formula. So speaking about some deviations or some biases in some schemes, I don't know. I think that every artist is looking for precisely that in a certain sense of a word, because this is the only thing that makes sense, a certain transgression, that is to say, make the systems transgress and make something that would turn static into dynamic, I don't know. The conversation is reminding me of a, of the sort of battle between Epic Mega Games and Apple over who controls payments in Fortnite, sort of. Um, 
just that we're talking about these things in terms of like traditional visual technologies and some of it, or at least I was, and as software that kind of frames our experience. But there's also some kind of aspect of it, which has to do with um, just more straight up ownership um, and, and creating sort of areas in which people want to spend time, especially in this world of pandemic and lockdown and unpredictable real space interaction. Um, and then being able to kind of control access and economy within those spaces. And I think that that feeling of, um, of ownership is um, something that actually comes across in different ways in both of your works. Um, on the one hand, through the question of labor, which is very much foregrounded in studio visit in particular, this kind of like deconstruction and send up of artistic labor. Um, and, in, and also the, the role of the museum as like a place that has kind of historically stolen objects that were made through someone else's labor. And then, you know, now um, we have this kind of example of maybe a sort of digital commons, which maybe has hobbyist labor or museum labor in it. Um, all these digital objects were kind of made by someone. So there's a kind of labor and ownership question. And then there's also sort of just the question of the power of these spaces themselves. And in Antigone, um, there's all of these shopping malls and there's the sense of, um, of, a, of a world in which the only public space is actually like this weird flooded, um, these flooded canals and stuff. Um, and then I think in um, Agency of No One, Sarah's, um, you know, the sense of the museum as like this all encompassing entity. So I think both like the work sort of touch on that question a little bit. And I wondered if, um, if you have, I guess, anything to add about the question of um, ownership and power and how they're playing out kind of within digital environments more, more directly and whether that was a part of your thinking about these works. Um, it's not something that I very, like labor is very, uh, very important like question in, in this, in these works, especially in studio visit, as you mentioned, like, uh, and I'm always like very aware of like sourcing other people's assets and the labor that this involves and also like trying to understand the purpose of these objects and why people made them and also why they made them public. Um, and then, yeah, at the same time, um, being a little bit more uh, uh, more humorous about the um, <clears throat> the act of physical labor itself and like thinking about it in a, in a in a virtual world I was curious Sarah if you are interested in the question of the provenance of the objects in your world. You mentioned it briefly, but um, these objects are they are they the the scans are they created by museums themselves? And I guess it's interesting because if that's the case, then maybe um, it's kind of almost more of an act of a colonial gesture to replicate them digitally rather than um, a form of artistic labor similar to what the orc is doing. Um, well, I can say that when I considered the collections that I found mostly on Sketchfab or some separate websites, there were two types of collections usually. The first type are official scans of museums. So these are institutional hostages. And the second type were attempts on behalf of some individuals. These were initiatives by some individuals that tried to bring those objects together in the form of a digital history for the further generations. So the motives may be different on behalf of museums and institutions. That's uh, 
a sense of penitence because at some point in time it belonged belonged only to archives and they are opening their archives trying to be democratic and trying to digitalize everything and uh, sometimes there are also just enthusiasts some diy artists or engineers or people who have access to those means some scholars perhaps who are digitalizing those objects but i can say that this is the labor that still requires some resources that means that equipment that is used by people who create assets is part of a unit of labor. It's not just a person. It's a person with a, a computer, a scanner, electricity source, and also some free time to dedicate to this work. So regarding the concept of work that is involved into creating those digital objects, I believe that this labor includes uh, some additions. It's a more complex phenomenon. It seems to me it seems to me that there is it seems to me that behind this accessibility we can also see not just the possibility of using it but also the following background you see this object and you cannot actually break this object from its history by downloading those megabytes, you are also downloading the load of colonial history and of all the other aspects. So the object does not exist in and of itself. It's also a unit of sense. It's not just a, a ceramic statue. So roughly speaking, those figures that describe the weight of this object also describe more than just the weight of this object. It seems that I'm not answering the questions really precisely all the time. <laughs> but I, I really like the way you talk about objects in particular. And so we've talked about the way in which objects are not really objects because they have a history of labor behind them. And they're not really objects because they're actually scripted actors within a game environment. So that's another way in which they're not really actors. Or sorry, they're not really objects. And they're also things that circulate on the network in a particular way that replicates patterns of colonial power and the way that knowledge is managed as a resource that's not evenly distributed, et cetera. So there's all these interesting ways where, you know, we kind of, in your work, we're kind of boiling this scene down to a series of objects. And then we have to understand that they're not actually objects <laughs> or that what we think of as an object is as, um, as we put it at Rhizome, thanks to my colleague Dragon Espenshed, we often say the performance of objecthood. So these objects are performing objecthood through digital labor, through computational processes, and through colonial patterns of circulation and, um, and knowledge management, which is an interesting set of problems for these objects to perform. What's the role of engineering activities and all that? Because uh, it seems that by avoiding the heritage of various platforms, museum platforms, historical platforms, digital platforms, we can find some alternatives in uh, engineering tools. I know that for one of the work of the pieces of work theo designed some specific trackers right some traces that can capture motion and uh, you designed them yourself manually basically i don't know sarah if you have any experience uh, in creating some digital tools and is it part of a certain strategy 
You mean motion capture? No, I mean in general. I mean assembling something yourself at a low level, some alternatives to a platform, some alternative heritage. You mean vernacular culture, popular culture, like some postcards uh, or albums that are created by people. I mean, something that is opposed to some high culture. Well, I was mostly speaking about engineering activity and engineering tools yourself. Well, I can say that I use a lot of found footage in my work and uh, I actually insert videos and photos that I find some logos, bits of Wikipedia articles. And uh, this is very natural. For example, I showed you the video and there at some point the, there is a group of men and uh, there is a stone next to them. This is uh, a society in France that was created around this meteorite called uh, Brothers Defenders of Meteorite. So this is a very conservative France, uh, a French province, and there is a certain geek community of uh, mostly adult men that uh, behave like a mysterious order and every year they celebrate this meteorite. And when I found that website of them, it was really weird because I did not have any context. There were people wearing some historical clothes uh, and hats, taking pictures of themselves next to stones. And this can also be called as some popular local culture because it was formed in a specific area in relation to a specific event. And I think that each time when you do your work naturally, you get terabytes and terabytes of materials. And uh, let's not also forget about various thematic forums that you have to read. And uh, when you analyze and study a subject, forums represent the only way to understand which people surround us, because we cannot physically communicate with such a big number of people and uh, instead we can read a lot of comments on reddit and so on so this literary popular culture is a very developed culture in russia at least for example in russia people use facebook to write this is literature indeed and those bits of culture seem to be quite important indeed so in addition to found footage, you can add some, not visual bits, but rather some comments on behalf of people, because this is the face of the world. This is the face of the user, those comments. Yes, Theo, what about you? Uh, How do you yeah. use those tools that you design yourself? Um, um, if I understand the question correctly, um, I'm, I have been very interested in the sort of tool making side of, of, of this, um, of this certain like workflows. Uh, and for instance, for studio visit, it was, I didn't have access to a proper motion capture suit. So I ended up like making a very DIY version of it uh by following online instructions and sourcing like different materials and the and then i that ended up of course affecting the way i was performing because i had to uh work around all the different glitches and uh strange artifacts that this system had um but yeah i think for for my practice is very important to be as hands on as possible with with these technologies and both the hardware and the like programming and software side uh, and 
really trying to dig in and see uh, ways that this can be pushed in different directions, basically. Uh, and I, I also really enjoy the process, like for studio visit, there wasn't a very clear uh, goal in starting the project or even midway through it, but it was a lot about um, like playing with this technology and trying to push its limits and um, understand ver like various ways to misuse it. Nice. I wanted to, I think maybe as a kind of final question, I wanted to bring in maybe the idea of, of mythology or mismaking. And, um, and this is something that um, it's a role that museums have historic have historically, at least in modern times, performed for us in certain ways. And it's also something that we see um, an effort to do often around technology companies and also within video game worlds, um, this idea of like, creating a kind of story that gives meaning to the game or to life itself um, or to specific ways that things are done in society. So the museum lends a sense of historical gravitas to practices that might other, otherwise seem new or strange. Um, there are all kinds of ways in which that plays out. But I wanted maybe, um, in, you know, I think that the work that we saw an excerpt of, of yours, Theo, of Antigone, Antigone, um, is almost explicitly a kind of myth-making project in some ways. And um, I was interested in asking if, I guess if you see the idea of creating a myth for a kind of post-climate world in which simulation and reality are quite kind of um, seamlessly blended together, if, the, if you can see a kind of positive role for that, um, or if there's more of an effort to deconstruct myth-making and, and show its limits. Um, or somewhere in the middle? Um, yeah, I think the, um, the myth-making aspect was quite important. I feel uh, it was uh, a challenge to both like create a world and create um, uh, this uh, post-climate change uh, environment and but not only like uh, artistically and visually, but try to think of um, how it would function as a society and uh, what would be the internal forces that drive this kind of world. Um, and of course, Connor Williamson, the comic book artist had uh, quite a meticulous uh, take on what, what, what is happening in this world. But yeah, at the same time, it is basically using this myth making as a, as a tool to, to predict and, and or criticize possible futures, basically. Sarah, for some reason, I think that a myth uh, for you could be one of uh, the particular examples of uh, the era of the survivor. I'm not, I'm not sure that's the way you see it. Well, the, the, the mistake of the survivor and this whole phenomenon was... Um, this was the first story that uh, drove me to create this project. Uh, I think it's a very interesting assumption, like mentally, somebody who miscalculated uh, and uh, this sort of, um, that's where the problem of calculations and measurements stem from because, well, it seems to me that the development in the measurements and we calculate and everything quantifying everything this is a side effect of uh, the human brain this urge to measure everything it's the it, the humans are the only creatures that measure things we measure history we'll always measure everything we'll always mismeasure remeasure make mistakes and come up with other systems of measurements and i find that captivating because what that means is 
like the digital world is not something that's uh, an isolated virtual simulation or a trend. This is something that's always been there. Digital has always been there. And now this is just the visualization. That's just the term which is now used a lot by contemporary museums. I don't know. So in a way, the myth is the myth of miscalculation, or maybe there's a larger myth of calculation and measurement that you're responding to with by focusing on on errors and distortions. Um, Sorry, perhaps I'm not going to fully respond to your question again here, but um, this is a series on Netflix uh, about British anarchy. It's very popular now about the crown. It's a story of a simulation. It's a great example of how simulations would actually look and what virtual reality is all about. It's interesting that virtual reality uh, contains reality in the, in the term. It's just a different type of reality. When I try to understand what monarchy stands for today in the current incarnation in various nations today, at least in Britain and Japan, you start to understand that this is this strange type, the, the, the sort of, it's a mothballed simulation that can describe a world that we could create in a gaming engine. What we're doing in units here and uh, Unreal Engine, the monarchy recreates, has been recreating for the last century, functioning in this unique shape in this they did this in, in, in a spheric isolation. Like it, it's going back to your question about the myths. I don't know. Perhaps we shouldn't be differentiating between the engineering components of the digital world and the other world because I think this is a single dimension. We can talk about the various intricacies because uh, we work with a certain type of production and as experts we see these more detailed granular elements uh, like uh, the, the various tumblers and the valves and like the various elements. Yeah. I think what's interesting, you know, when we talk about simulation, we're talking about um, a kind of model that can produce an outcome. And I think that's something that in tech conversations about computers has differentiated simulation from older forms of representation, which the idea is that an older image might sit on the wall and you look at it, but that it's not enacting a process that creates a different world. And, um, and I think what you're suggesting is that in fact, older, there are older forms of simulation that do produce the world and that monarchy could be considered a form of representation that actively, that actively shapes the sort of world that we're living in. And so I think that we should invite William and Harry onto our next uh, conversation, which is happening Wednesday at noon in New York time and 7 p.m. Moscow. Um, if they say no, we'll just uh, we'll ask for some other members of the royal family to join us to talk um, along with um, Tabor Roback and oh wait I'm sorry is it Tabor on Wednesday or is it yeah yeah and yeah the... so Tabor Roback and Mikhail Maximov will be joining us for World Under Wire Dialogues two Wednesday at 12 p.m. New York 7 p.m. Moscow um, I want to say a really big thank you to to Theo and Sarah for a very interesting and illuminating exploration of your work. Um, that was really, um, I feel like I've um, gained deeper insight into your own work, but also different ways of thinking about um, other aspects of, um, of simulation today. So thank you both. Yes, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm not sure if we have any questions uh, from the audience. Um, we have uh, a minute, uh, perhaps. Uh, no questions at this point.
Um, so join us on Wednesday for the next um, in this series. I believe that the recording of this will be online for people to refer back to. There's yeah. plenty, plenty more to unpack. Um, and um, yeah, Garage Digital has an ongoing program online, but I know that assuming distance ends this, this Sunday. Mm -hmm. And uh Да, вы все еще можете попасть на, 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 на выставку. You can still get to the exhibition uh, distance uh, at the garage uh, and uh, Sarah's work is available on Garage Digital. You can also access uh, them. You can have a look at all of the series uh, that have been out so far. You can monitor them as new ones emerge as well. And uh, this conversation is um, is prompted in part by a partnership um, that, or by a, a rising and of the new museum and Hyundai Motors exhibition World on a Wire on view now in Seoul and coming to Moscow this fall. So look out for that, everyone. Um, thanks so much to all of you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for the discussion. See you soon. Yeah, thanks for hosting us. <laughs> It was great to great to see your face, Theo, and great to meet you, Sarah. Are are are, are we uh, on air now? <laughs> no. I think we should assume that we still are, but um, we still are. Maybe they're going to hold us to our. No,